um, your computer number at student.unza.zm. So you should be able to work. You just go to, it's a managed service. It's um, managed by the Google. So you log in just as you would log in using your Gmail account if you have a Gmail account, right? Um, so the reason I'm bringing that up is because um, ideally, it would have been nice if this thing was mounted somewhere, right? But now we have a class in the CS department. There's order there, right? Uh, <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, well, the, I had a class actually yesterday. At, uh, there's order there. There's, there's, sorry? Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, this is fine. I'm just saying uh, it would have been nice instead of every time I, you come, you set up and you come with cables, right? But. But yeah, so I don't know if, uh, so what, what I was saying is maybe we might as well talk about it anyway, uh, seeing as we are here, um, a little bit of time. So the way you log in is, uh, uh, you, you log in just, so you go to google.com or whatever, right? Oh, and there's no internet access here. And uh, once you go there, you just, uh, you log in using your computer number. Has anyone managed to log in? You, you, no, not yet? Okay, but so if you you log in the same way you log in as staff is the same way you log in. Uh, no, no, you don't. You can check right now. You are not registered. No. Yes. Then we use you as an example just now to show that you don't necessarily have to be registered for you to log in. Uh, hopefully, this internet thing is going to work. Uh, So is, 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 is the beaming fine, by the way? Is this fine or maybe it's slightly back? So can, can people see here? Hmm. Need to focus it more. This is the best I can do, I guess. Maybe the white small zoom in. Oh, maybe it's me. Oh, it's fine, right? Okay. Uh, so the way you log in, right, you go to, let's say, google.com, or go, like in this case, google.co.zm or zday or whatever. So you sign in, right? And then the way you sign in is, um, and I'm, I'm bringing all this up because the first um, assignment by paper reading, is the summarization of the papers, is uh, the open date is Friday, and so I want to make sure you're able to do this. So you, you, you get, what's your computer number again, 2018? Is there someone, can we use you as an example? 24? 61? 51. So computer number at student dot unza dot zm, right? And then once you enter like that, it will prompt you for, here's to hoping things work here. This is, ah, oh, this is where it seems. Hmm. I don't know if it's the internet or if. Uh, um. I guess hopefully it works. I mean, usually one would expect, oh, there's maybe my fault. I'll, I'll have to start coming with, uh, with an Ethernet cable, I guess. I didn't know this was here. Okay, maybe it will help. So I mean, the other thing is, uh, and uh, she probably knows, right? The, the other thing is those credentials become useful for, not that it matters, for EduRom. So we know Zikas has EduRom as well. 
so you can use the same credentials. But so it doesn't matter for you because I'm guessing you use your idiom credentials from Zika's here, right? So, but yeah. So for those of us that that don't know, we can literally take advantage of that and, and, and essentially this doesn't seem like it's working anyway. It's fine. We can just proceed with why we're here. Uh, I, I was so hoping could. Uh, oh. We could show people exactly how this works. Um, anyway, we are. We will. When it comes up, we shall briefly switch because it's a long session. Anyway, so. All right. So the. the so our, our lecture number two, which was supposed to be done about a month ago, but hopefully we'll be able to catch up here. Um, so this is what I was saying. I was saying the the, the model is is now up and running. So we want to make sure that we we check if um, if we have access uh, because, uh, like I said, our first reading is going to be due on. I'm looking for. I'm sorry for the disorganization. I'm just coming for another class and I thought I had okay, don't. No. Um, so this whole notion of paper readings right I, I will be the one who suggests I'll suggest the paper but besides the summaries the idea is we'll dedicate maybe some 15 to 20 minutes and discuss the paper as a group uh, I have found it's it's useful to, to try and understand exactly what other people are doing when you share thoughts, right? Um, you realize that uh, my, my thoughts and interpretation of the paper will be different from his and hers, and so it's always nice to share ideas like that. You learn better that way, actually. So the, the process, like I said last time, will be such that um, you submit the summaries, obviously, um, but we'll have a discussion as well on the paper itself. Something else I'm suggesting is we start rotating. So I will first of all suggest the paper, and then the other week, the rotation will continue from whatever order you people decide. Um, I, I, I know uh, where I went, the lab I was in, we, we used to come up with different schemes. I right? say, no, because people would say, no, no one wants to volunteer to be the first, right? They say, OK, then we use uh, last names of a bit code or something, or, or first names, I don't know. But you decide if you want. And I'm sure you can come up with a better way. Um, and then you let us know to say this is the order we've decided as a group, right? It's, it's nothing complex. Um, and then a possible invited industry talk is supposed to be by someone from CIDAS. We think it would be nice if um, they haven't yet confirmed, they haven't responded to the last communication I had with them. Um, but we thought it would be appropriate after our, our lecture on the introduction to information systems and management to have someone from an organization which extensively makes use of uh, information systems, right? It's in the health sector quite right, but it would be nice to have them come and give a talk about different types of systems that they use, right? Um, so, CIDAS. <coughs> and then, so the, the outline today is like this. I thought we'd split it into two parts. We have an introduction and then just a, seeing as Friday is when the first paper is, is, is the open date for the paper summary's assignment, I thought it would be nice for us to just have a, a chat about, uh, a chat on pointers on, you know, how to go about the reading process um, if people are not yet aware. But if we did a fourth year project, then maybe we should have an idea, I suppose, on where to find resources and whatnot. But just in case, it would be nice to talk about that. Um, right, so we'll leave it towards the end, but we'll start, off, uh, we'll start with just a brief introduction. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about. I mean, so, Really, um, a general introduction to the things we're calling information systems, right? Um, and we'll specifically focus on, on examples, just to get a sense of the different types of um, information systems that are available out there. All right. Uh, so it, it's always, I've always found it's, it's, it's really helpful to have a discussion the fundamental differences between data information and we should have had knowledge there, right? Uh, and I'm sure we know about this. It's important because fundamentally what, what these information systems help us do is to try and make sense out of 
the data that we use them to, the data that we feed to them so that they process and then later on spit back the results, right? Um, so typically you start out with, um, with this data that you might have, right? You, you cannot really make sense out of it, right? It's maybe just a combination of what people normally refer to as raw facts, right? Um, and then you use the information system to try and uh, process it and organize it in a way that will result in information, right? So there's some sort of um, meaning associated to the, to the output that comes out of there, right? Um, and in fact, when you talk about organization, that's when you, you actually start touching on this whole notion of knowledge, right? So data, information, and knowledge. So um, this is an example we had last year where we're trying to, um, to kind of illustrate this whole notion of data, right? So if we were to, to, to give someone this information, it would be hard for them to, to, to really try and make sense out of this, right? Um, so, but what, what is, because these are, this is nothing but facts, right? It's just data, raw data. <laughs> it's hard to make sense out of what's happening here. But if we were to use an information system, let's say um, a database, for instance, assuming this, these raw facts were inserted into a in, into relational database management system, and we apply some processing, query that information somehow, and organize it in a way that makes sense, would potentially come up with a result like this, right? Something that makes sense. So we know that uh, what we're looking at here is, uh, um, I guess, information to do with an MLIS program um, whose duration is two years, right? It's it's, um, it's offered, the MLIS program is offered in the Department of Library of Information Science in the School of Education, and the number of students, this was in 2018, the number of students in, enrolled into that program were eight. This is, this is meaningful somehow, right? So information, data. Right, <coughs> right. so I mean, so this notion of information systems, right? I mean, um, I, I guess it's best understood when you, you start to look at what, 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 what this whole notion of the system is all about, right? Um, hmm. I have no idea why I have updated documents on the website here. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I don't know what I was trying to say here, but, <coughs> but a system is nothing more than a way of trying to come up with um, I guess uh, processes and procedures that will result in um, a way of trying to meaningfully organize things, right? Um, so we just said that we will have paper reading sessions, right? And we, we are going to be rotating, right? Suggesting papers every week as a group, right? Or taking turns. We've come up with a system, right, of doing that. Right? And you notice that um, there are fundamental characteristics that are associated with the system, right? So you have things like there are specific elements that are interrelated with each other, right? Um, so it's, it's a feedback loop, uh, kind of like a feedback loop, right? So we all defined boundaries associated with these different elements, right? And these different elements will typically uh, interact with each other, right? Um, and even though these, you have these different elements that are interrelated, the, the, the thing to point out here is the fact that um, there's a shared objective, right? So they do, you know, these elements do different things, but ultimately they are working towards the same objective or the same goal, right? In the case of our paper reading session, we're trying to better understand uh, this broad field of information systems and management, right? <coughs> right, so um, if we were to kind of come up with a classic definition of what an information system is, or what information system are, is what we're saying is um, it's nothing more than a set of interrelated elements or components, right, that um, collect, process, and disseminate output or data, right, um, to work towards a certain objective. And, and really, um, this is kind of interesting, if you look at some of these, these things that we have here, like uh, input, process, uh, and output in relation to information system, you notice that fundamentally this is what a computer system actually does, right? A computer system is nothing more than, um, and this is the thing, computer system, information system. A computer system is nothing more than an electronic device apparently that um, accepts input, 
processes the input, it optionally has a provision to store the, 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 the data or the input that it has processed and then provide some sort of meaningful output, right? Um, so fundamentally, the, the key things here that we are saying an information system does, right? It enables us to collect data, input. What we're feeding it is data, obviously. It's almost always data, right? Uh, and then what it does is it processes or manipulates that data. Um, and then it has a way of um, providing, providing this output. And remember that this output is what we are calling information, right? We start out with data, which is raw facts, and then end up with information after processing is done to the input data, right? Um, so this is just a visual representation of what's going on here, uh, of input, processing, and output. Um, so again, if, if you look at this visual representation, it ties into what we're uh, referring to as the core characteristics associated with a system, right? Interrelated elements, right? Um, they, they perform different things, but they have well-defined boundaries, right? Uh, but there's some sort of interaction that happens here. So for, for instance, your, your, your input element is kind of interacting with the processing element here because it feeds input data into the processing element. So, I mean, so this definition of information system, right, one would argue actually that when we're talking about information system, it's not entirely the case that we are always referring to computer-based systems like databases, for instance. Right? An information system could be something that has nothing to do with, with computers, right? Uh, yeah? Is, is, it, is that not so? Does, is this notion of information always linked to computer systems. Would you not, would we not say uh, what you have in that book is somewhat information or something, right? You are getting raw facts from light on as is ranting and yapping around. <laughs> Hopefully you are co converting it into meaningful things that you understand, right? which is information. I guess it's an information system, I would say. I'm saying all that because we're trying to make a distinction. Computer-based information systems is what we're interested in, right? We started off with defining what a system is, we're saying information system, and now we're saying computer-based information system, right? Um, <coughs> and you notice that uh, if, if you compare it with these three broad elements here, you look at a, a computer-based system, what we're saying is uh, it's best defined by, by looking at the, the broad components that make up this computer-based information system, right? So you have people, right, human beings, and I would prefer to say end users here instead of people, but we'll stick with people here, right? So there's people, there's hardware, there's software, there's communication networks, and then there's data sources, right? So a computer-based system similar to an information system collects, transforms or processes, and then disseminates um, the output of information in an organization, right? Uh, and we, we have, a, hopefully, a discussion of, oh, no, we don't. Uh, I guess we can talk about this. So. So you look at your typical information system and obviously it becomes useless if, if you, you don't take into account the, the human beings or the entities that are ultimately going to make sense or make use of that information system, computer-based information system, right? And because we are talking about um, computers here, this computer-based information system, you cannot run away from the fact that you need hardware, right? And by hardware, we might be referring to things like maybe desktop computers that you might be using in a, an organization, server computers that you might be using to host uh, enterprise applications, like um, the Moodle, for instance, is a computer-based information system. It sits on a server computer somewhere, CICT, right? You obviously need software, right, because it's computer-based. Um, we cannot run away from the fact that we need software, right? Hardware itself on its own is useless without software. We use software to tell the hardware what to do, right? Um, and then you need some sort of communication network, right? Because when you have a whole host of people making use of this computer-based system, there has to be a way in which you, you are transmitting whatever data and information the, 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 the people, the end users might be manip manipulating, right? So by communication network, ne networks here, we might be referring to things like the local area network, for instance, right? Wi-Fi. Um, because of the Wi-Fi that we have or the wired network that we have, which is a communications, falls under communications network, 
I can easily interact with someone who is at VET. I can use what? I guess uh, email, right? Email can be classified as computer-based information system to communicate with that person, right? Um, you typically um, have data resources. Uh, so the things that you are, you are manipulating, right, need to be perhaps stored somewhere. Like in the case of Moodle, um, these messages that people send using Moodle, for instance, are stored somewhere. It's data a database, right, a relational database management system. So all those fall under the category of data resources, right? Um, so using all these five elements, um, we're saying we're able to um, collect, process, and disseminate information in an organization, right? Um, I guess a pretty nice visual presentation here with the components that we just spoke about. This databases thing here is referring to the data resources. Right? Uh, is the, data, the data resources might not necessarily be just databases. It could be spreadsheets. I don't know what else people use to store and share data, data here. I mean, but we are broadly defining data resources here. We're not just saying it's databases. It could be a whole range of things here. It could be simple files, right? Flat files, for instance. And we forgot the important thing here, it's supposed to be procedures as well, right? Um, it's a system, there has to be this whole thing, the interaction of these different components has to be done in a systematic way, in a systematic manner. <coughs> All right, it's always nice to kind of define, now that we've looked at these five broad components, um, it's always nice to kind of highlight the things that map onto um, things to do with computers, right? Technology, technology part. Um, so you notice that it's the four components on top there. Th these are the components we're referring as um, information technology, right? Um, they collectively form the infrastructure, right? If, uh, the technology stack that is used to collect, transform, and dis disseminate information, right? Um, so we've already defined these hardware components here, so things like computer systems that we're using, uh, the routers that might be used by CICT to ensure that data is being transmitted between the different entities, for instance, right? Um, what other hardware infrastructure do you think we have at a place like Unza or Zika? Printers, right? Yeah. Yes, um, projectors, right? Um, yeah. Um, we could go on and on and, uh, in trying to identify the different hardware components or hardware entities that are used in um, an organization like Moons or Zikas. Um, we could do the same for software, right? If you look at Moons, it's not just Moodle, right? It's the institutional repository, it's a website, it's SR, uh, the HR systems that they use for the payroll. Um, for the case of the library, I mean, you have, uh, I don't know if you've already migrated to Unicorn, but there's Unicorn. Um, all sorts of different tools, like an organization like Unza, for instance, has a whole host of you know, technology stuff that they use, right? Which fall under the confines of information technology, they all have software. Um, obviously, there's also communications, um, networks, or infrastructure. And we have a dedicated lecture series, by the way, where we look at, um, we look at um, computer networks, right? Um, so we'll touch more on communication ones once we discuss that. We also have a dedicated lecture series on relational database management systems, right? Well, database management systems in general, but we are specifically going to focus on relational database management system. And you notice that the, the themes we are covering, actually, I don't know if people have figured this out already. The, theme, the themes we are covering, the things that we're going to look at, you know, computer networks, the World Wide Web, um, uh, digital libraries, uh, integrated library systems, um, information retrieval systems. All of these actually fit into these things that we're describing here. Um, uh, perhaps towards the end, we're going to look at, uh, I guess, is it major issues or something? Issues related to what we're doing, this is where the people and procedures will probably come up with something. Uh, prob also going to come up when we look at library automation as part of integrated library systems, right? So, thought I'd mention that, right? But bottom line here, takeaway point is looking at these five broad components that make up a computer-based information system. We are saying these four entities here, hardware, software, communication, 
networks and data sources collectively make up the information technology of a typical organization. Right. <laughs> so when we're talking about um, hardware here, we just cited examples already, right? Where I, I didn't know there was a slide like this. Oh God. Um, so we, had, we already had a discussion about some typical examples of these hardware components we're referring to, right? Uh, something worth mentioning here is uh, the, the type of hardware infrastructure, in fact, technological infrastructure that you typically have is dependent on the domain within which the organization falls under, right? So um, institutions of higher learning have specific you know, technology stacks that they use, for instance. It might be different when compared to an organization like, let's say, Ministry of Finance. Maybe they use different types of tools and hardware that we, we don't know about, I don't know. The central bank, I wonder what type of hardware they use that they make money, they print money, so maybe they, I don't know, but molding out here. Um, now again, we already had a, a discussion of computer software, uh, and just to re reiterate here that uh, we are, again, when we were discussing um, hypertext markup languages, and specifically HTML, we shall touch, touch on this whole notion of content management systems, um, because they've become, I guess, an integral part of most of these organizations, right, as far as computer-based uh, information systems are concerned. You find them everywhere. The, the UNSA, for instance, didn't use as an example, and in fact, we'll start using Zikas as an example because we have two people from Zikas. Um, the website that Zikas uses is probably a content management system, right? Zikas probably has a learning management system, which is a specific type of a content management system, right? Um, so we can go on and on and cite examples of content management systems, but we'll touch on content management systems so that we see exactly how they work. And to give us a sneak preview, um, they kind of involve some, some of the things that we are going to look at before we discuss content management systems, like they have an interface which is web-based obviously, so you need um, a markup language, an HTML for you to implement such an application. They're database driven, so you need to understand this whole notion of relational database management system or database management system, right? Um, yeah. <coughs> um, and then during our discussion of computer networks, we'll have a rundown of how local area networks are different from uh, metropolitan networks, what area networks, and this whole notion of virtual private networks. And then we'll look at the, arguably the, the largest network we know, of, which is uh, the internet, right? Um, is interesting and look at the whole range of services that that uh, are available via the internet, right? Incidentally, there's always a misconception when we talk about the internet that it deals with um, the World Wide Web, right? The web as they call it, but there's there's a lot happening, you know, um, a number of different services. Some of the services people don't know about actually, right? SSH, for instance, FTP. Um, when you're sending email, you're not necessarily, you're using a different protocol from protocol that is used by, uh, uh, by um, websites, for instance, when you're accessing um, web content, right? HTTP or HTTPS compared with uh, SMTP, for instance, right? Yeah, so I already mentioned the fact that when you're talking about data sources, it's not like we're exclusively talking about relational database management systems or database management systems, but we could be using flat files, right? Could be distributed file systems, for instance. Um, incidentally, all of these things are, will be shared, the slides, right? But uh, <coughs> now there was um, a pause at some stage, we need to start pausing, depending on how much time we have, I think we still have time, just in case people start s sleeping here, right? The writing part reminded me of, um, uh, my alma mater has lecture recording infrastructure, so everything that happens in a lecture venue like this one is automatically recorded. But of course the, the, the person who is giving the talk, the presentation, gets to decide if they want it to be recorded, some people, interestingly enough, don't want to be recorded. 
Not only that, you get to specify if you want the recording to be accessible to the wider public or just to the university community, which is kind of interesting. So um, I remember there being a complaint, uh, especially in the computer science department I was under, that uh, very few students were attending lectures because they knew that there would be a recording of what happened in class, right? Um, so why go to class when there's a recording? It turns out it's actually helpful to go, oh, finally found it. Turns out it's actually helpful to to attend classes, but uh, yeah. So I thought I'd mention that somehow I feel it's always nice to have a laser pointer, but I can't find the the other gadget I use. You know, I thought I'd mention that. All right. So if we um, if we were to just kind of briefly look at uh, information systems and uh, computer-based information systems and try to distinguish them from information technology. For instance, we already know the difference, right? Collectively, like an information system will be composed of, I guess collectively it's this, right? But when we are talking about, um, well, I guess information technology, um, things kind of change here. <coughs> uh, I guess the fundamental difference is that uh, the technology is an enabler, right? It allows us to, to implement these things we are, we are calling information, a computer-based information system. I, I want us to explicitly state here that what we're referring to is a computer-based information system, right? It's a computer-based information system because we have information technology and we know that information technology is made up of these things here, right? <coughs> right. Um, so yeah, so we use the technology to implement these different types of information systems, right? So a payroll system, an inventory system, it could be a customer relationship management system. The list is endless here, right? Um, again, if we were to come up with a visual uh, representation here, a simple block diagram that shows us that we are using the technology as an enabler to enable us to come up with this or implement this information system, right? But bearing in mind that the information system itself is incomplete without these two entities below here, right? The end users that get to interact with this uh, information technology, right? And the corresponding procedures, the rules set in place to use this information system. Um, so in, in terms of, like if we were to come up with a classification uh, or categorization of information systems, they broadly fall into what you might call uh, operations support systems and management support systems, right? Um, operation, I mean, these words are kind of self-explanatory here. Uh, so if we were to look at specific examples of operation support system here, we are looking at, uh, and most of these are actually domain specific, so transaction processing systems. Process control systems, if um, it's an organization like like Pamalat, I suppose, I don't know. Office automation systems, which are actually, um, I guess, common in the various different domains that we have, right? You're, you're typically looking at automating what goes on in a typical office environment, right? Um, and then you have management support systems, which are typically used as a way, uh, as, as the first way it suggests, typically used to make decisions, right? These are the types of systems that are used by, if we're looking at the hierarchy of employees in a typical organization, you're looking at management, right? Um, they are not interested in the gory details of what's happening. For instance, if you say, uh, I don't think the librarian would be interested in, the ones are librarian, actually the deputy librarian, the librarian of Zika, would be interested in finding out the specifics of how does the R IR work, right? What are the, details associated with how this institution reports to actually work. She's not interested in that. She might be interested in, in saying, if, uh, what, are there, can you generate statistics um, associated with people that were accessing the repository, which countries were they, they coming from? That's, that's the information she's interested in. And she's interested in that information because she attends upper management meetings where she's required to present that type of information. It's decision support, right, systems. Um, perhaps based on those those statistics, they might come up with world decisions like, oh, um, seeing as most of the hits are coming from South Africa, then maybe we should, maybe uh, next year we should plan to have 
consultative meetings where we can maybe sign MOUs with those universities because perhaps they're working on problems that are similar to the problems we work on at UNSA, for instance, right? Um. <coughs> right, so you just mentioned that uh, when we're talking about operation support systems here, all we're referring to here is uh, systems that process um, data generated by the business operations, right? So the data that we generate at UNSA, or Zikas, can you give an example of data we generate at Zikas? We're putting you on the spot. Sorry, your, your colleague is not here today. Can we, can we, what type of data do you think we generate as, as Zikas here? Fundamental is it? What type of data is, is generated? Zikas as an organization. Maybe details to do with, uh, hey, we can't run away from the fact that in a way, it's a business, we're making money, right? So um, we generate data to do with how much money you've made, right? From tuition fees, perhaps. Um, I'm sure you will hold workshops and whatnot, you know. You have obviously software that does that, right? Um, you know, and I guess that software will probably fall under the confines of transaction processing systems, right? All right, so if we look at, uh, if we were to kind of narrow down on specifics of some of these subcategories of uh, operation support systems. Um, so we look at transaction processing systems here, we're looking at um, uh, systems that are used to maintain records about um, exchange of interactions, right? Um, perform computations and calculations, uh, process business exchanges. Um, you have process control systems that these are mostly specific to, I guess, organizations that, that center around um, business automation, right? So manufacturing organizations, I mentioned Pamelite, but there's a whole host of them out there, right? So you might be interested in automating some of the things that you do so that you must produce whatever products you might be, you might be selling to the general public, right? Uh, mass production transfers to money, obviously, more profit. Um, you already mentioned office automation here. I mean, this is an obvious thing. I mean, you could cite examples of, uh, um, I guess, your office packages, for instance, it would be an example of uh, office automation systems, right? Instead of you manually writing things down, you have void processors. Instead of you uh, using funny things to, to compute things, you have spreadsheets that are part of these office packages that people use, right? So you're enhancing office communication. Instead of you, and some people like this a lot here, it's sad really, they want you to go to their office because they can't respond to email. Email is an enabler of office automation, but people want you to go and knock at their office to say, no, I, I was wondering if you would help with this, right? We've automated uh, that whole process, I don't know. All right, uh, we've already mentioned uh, this issue of uh, management support systems. Um, Fundamentally, they are tied to decision making, right? So we're looking at systems that enable us to extract useful information that is going to be used to make decisions. So UNSA um, sometimes will say, you know, we've come up, uh, we've come up with new programs, and I'm sure Zika does the same. Um, you just don't wake up and say we're going to come up with a new program, right? I'm sure they, there are certain systems that they use to generate statistics and be able to figure out to say. I mean, you present a business case and tell people to say, you know what, if we introduce this program, this is what, we'll, this is what we, might, we might potentially end up with. Um, you need to justify why you're coming up with, with a new program, right? You'd have obviously collected some useful information somewhere. Say maybe there's high demand, uh, I don't know. Uh, so you use this decision support system to extract that useful information, be able to make that decision. I don't know what other high level, you're in management, right? You're, is, is your position upper mind? No, it's not. Okay. I'm going to say maybe you could give, you could have some insight on some of uh, management decisions that are made and some, some information that is used to inform those decisions or something. <clears throat> right. I mean, so typically, I mean, if you look at the obvious advantages associated with these subcategories sub of um, these subcategories of management support systems, like management information systems, which is support systems and executive information systems, we're saying, uh, talking about management information system, it's all about efficiency, right? We're looking at 
how quickly you can make decisions, for instance, or how quickly you can do certain things. Um, <coughs> uh, typical questions that are answered by these decision support systems, these are obvious things here. Uh, what if we introduced a, a new program? What are the implications, right? Um, what if we did A because the statistics in the institutional repository is say X? What if we introduce a linear management system because A, B, C, D, although people are not using it here at Tunes, right? Um, right, I guess key things to, to point out on executive information systems is because these people are looking for summaries, usually these things will have a visual representation of information, right? So uh, management typically would not be interested in detailed reports, 100 page reports, so and graphs I suppose and tables say this is the thing here. Um, <coughs> I want to be able to make decisions within the shortest period of time here. All right, so some other interesting categories are listed here, you know, expert systems, um, end user computer systems, uh, business information systems, and you know, some, some of these classes or subcategories are normally domain specific actually. Um, like I know increasingly the medical field is making use, I doubt if Zambia is doing this, but they're making use of expert systems, right? Um, because we've reached a stage where we're able to easily collect useful information to do with health, for instance, or diseases, you can have a system that will, you feed it information and you'll be able to automatically tell you to say, this person is potentially suffering from this illness, right? Expert systems. I don't know if we have that in Zambia. Uh, I was at this hospital called Coptic the other time and I was filling in a manual form and I'm thinking, do they have expert systems? I don't think so. I don't think so because when I, maybe they do, but when I went into the doctor's office, I went around in the radiology department, got x-rays, I've had a problem with my back for years here, I think sitting on the computer. But I also went to the lab and, but still I don't think they have any expert systems. It's a manual process. Because the doctor has to sit down and he's reading that report from the lab, right? And he uses his prior knowledge to try and infer, to say this is the likely cause, this is what's potentially happening to you, and then he'll say go and get this medication from the pharmacy. But bottom line here, I don't, I don't think Coptic has any expert system. Right? This, this is, it's, a, it's become a, a big thing, especially that we are, we are now living in what they, in what they call what, a data-driven society, right? Um, it's, it's a shame we haven't reached a stage where we could make use of some of these things. Right? We could avoid uh, a, a number of things here. Yeah. Cancers, for instance, with expert systems, you, you can, I guess you can, you can come up with preventive measures and be able to prevent deaths, but I don't know. Maybe they do at UTH, I don't know, but I doubt. It's uh, firefighting, I've always thought. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought, it's always nice to have uh, like a rundown of um, different, different information, computer-based information systems that are out there and perhaps things that we are familiar with, the famous uh, SIS system here, right? Uh, I'm curious as to what we think uh, is the category that this thing falls under, right? The student information system, we all have access to this, right? What do we think is, if we look at the different things that we looked at here, would this be, we'll start, would this be an operation support system or a management support system, a student information system? If you just quickly think about what it's used for, right? Thoughts? Like if you look at the broad categories of, um, of operation support system, transaction processing, process control, office automation, yeah? And if you look at management support systems, management information systems, decision support, executive information, what do you think SIS? We've all used, we know what the student information system is, right? You've, you, you've logged in, yes? You, you do, but maybe she does. Mr. Koi might not know because, uh, unless if you, but you should have logged in before here, right? This is where you check information to do with registration and whatnot. Incidentally, when I sent the list of uh, this class to 
CICT to have them create our emails, I went into SIS and extracted that information, right? It has a wealth of information, by the way. Um, uh, your next of kin, you can see all that information there. I don't have access to other information, obviously, because I guess they have, um, depending on what they think you might want to extract from here, you're bad from, from getting access to certain features, right? But, but I mean, if you really look at this, right, um, there are useful reports that can be generated from this system. So obviously it falls under management information system. And in fact, if, if let's say there's a meeting and they're trying to find out um, how many students are enrolled this year, for instance, and so the numbers are down because bursaries has been scrapped off and whatnot here, D different story, that's undergraduate numbers. But if, if let's say there was a meeting that was centered around that, reports would have to be generated from here. There's no other place, as far as I know, this is the only platform that is available at UNSA that keeps those statistics that you can use to try and figure out how many students um, were enrolled in the academic year 2018-2019. It has useful information like payment details, finance details, right? You would use this, right? Decision making, perhaps, I don't know. It, it does, I was coming to that, actually, yes, it does. It falls under both, it depends, because it's so, because of the nature of what it's used for, right? Um, it falls under both, and I was just explaining a small little part, report generation, decision making, it's actually both, <coughs> right? And it depends, an interesting thing here is, if you look at, if you look at this thing we're discussing here about the, the, the what? The people aspect, if you look at SIS, and SIS and most of these other systems, right? To decide on whether it, it falls in, in category A or B is, is best done by looking at the different end users, different class of users, right? If you look at this thing, right? The students use this, people from finance use this, um, the lecturers, upper management uses this, right? So it's both. Um, I use it to, what do I use it for? So when, when the time comes, for instance, to, to enter grades, apparently, there's a way of going to the class list, for instance, generate the class list, and then, or you up, upload the grades, for instance. Um, if I'm trying to get a sense of how many students are currently enrolled in, especially for larger classes, right, I'm trying to get a sense of that, I use this, right? Uh, my needs are different from, let's say, maybe the VC, if there's a high-level meeting, right? I'm not interested in, couldn't possibly think of what I would use the stats on how many students across UNSA failed per school, right, last year. I mean, there are reports to generate that, but I, I have no use for that information. It has nothing to do with me, right? But, you know. <coughs> um, I, I, I like using the IR, I started using the IR as an example last year, so teaching this course last year anyway, but I use it as an example because it's coming up when we discuss digital libraries, so um, again, we've already given out some things here, but again, if I were to classify this, looking at what it's used for, uh, do you think it's for, it's for, um, and forget about the statistics here, uh, let's, let's concentrate on on the main thing of what, what the IR does, right? It's used to what? To, it's used to disseminate score output generated by a typical institution of hiring, right? So if, if fundamentally, if that's what it's used for, do you think it would fall under operation support or management support? <laughs> it's like, a, it's a puzzle, right? I don't know. I would wager that it's operation support, actually. Yeah, dissemination of information. Right? But if you look at the, the other part that I, uh, I talked about, the issue to do with maybe generating statistics, for instance, and changes. And in fact, increasing, I think, is going to be used to, for things like um, pro promotion, for instance, right? Well, because when they're promoting people, one of the things they potentially look at is 
what, what, what sort of publications has this person done, right? Um, and so, because the IR fundamentally is supposed to, although it's not extremely used for that at all, but in an ideal case, it's supposed to be used to, to, to store whatever square output is generated at a place like Zika or Unza, right? You put it there. A copy, could be a preprint, right? If you publish in, in maybe in some high profile journal like computers and education or who knows, maybe nature or something, ideally what the IR is meant to do is you put the preprint, an exact copy of that into the IR, right? If you do that, you know that uh, at some stage, if maybe the time comes for someone to apply for a promotion, um, even though they're looking at citations and whatnot, but to verify, they'll probably come to a place like the institutional repository to try and see. Did this person actually author this document, right? That's what certain places do, anyway. Right? So our institutional repository is a computer-based information system, I guess. Right. <laughs> All right, so it was a, a fairly kind of short talk here, but I thought um, we'd use the remaining time here to, to talk about the paper reading session here. We, we were, I was going to suggest that we, I was also going to suggest that we, we were supposed to actually, but because of the confusion, we were supposed to have a trial, um, a trial reading session, um, and the reason we were supposed to have a trial reading session is, is I wanted us to, to know what to expect when, when we're doing that paper summary, right? But I, I think we can talk about it when I'm describing the paper reading sessions and whatnot. And then something else that I had planned to do, even though it's not part of this, is I wanted us to just have a mini trial uh, presentation or a talk, so that when this person comes on the fourth, because we had agreed collectively as a group that there are marks that are going to come from these seminars that we'll be attending, right? Marks for participation and attendance, right? Especially participation, anyway. Um, so I was thinking I'll do a quick trial, right, based on some work I did last year, um, so that you know what to expect when someone like Mshashu comes, someone like Mr. Konga once he, he agrees to come. Uh, Mr. Konga is the director of Zamrin. I don't know if people know about Zamrin. Zamrin is an entity that makes possible things like Edgeron, right? So when he comes to give a talk that's centered on computer networks, we want to know what to expect. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give a trial run once, a trial uh, presentation. Uh, it, for me, it's always an opportunity to, it's a shameless plug, I apologize, but an opportunity to get to talk about some of the work I do, right, or some of the work I've done. You know how when you write that dissertation, um, only your internal examiners and your supervisors potentially are going to read that document, right? Uh, so when you get the opportunity to tell people about what you did, you grab the bull by the horns, like I'm going to do after I talk about this paper reading session just now. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me as I'm talking about this, but <coughs> <coughs> so what, I was, um, what we had said about the paper reading sessions is that ideally <coughs> the plan is for us to, because our lecture is on Wednesdays, the plan is to make sure that the paper, the one who is responsible for securing a reading paper circulates it a couple of days in advance, perhaps even a Thursday before, right? In fact, there's, once we come up with a rota, there's, there's nothing to prevent us from already start looking for papers that we're going to suggest. It's a simple task, just suggesting a paper. You go out there and you look for a paper. We'll look at how, and I think we already know how to look for papers, right? Um, so you circulate it to the mailing list, obviously, right? To tell everybody to say, this is the paper that I'm suggesting. Um, but the takeaway point is you want to make sure that everybody has enough time to, to read the paper. So at least by Thursday, maybe Friday, so that people have Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. If it's a, yeah, if it's, it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, at least four days. But the weekend, we don't count. Right? So Thursday is good. Maybe. So you circulate the paper like I will. In fact, uh, incidentally, in my case, this is slide number 26, in my case, I've already circulated my, my suggested paper, which is, hmm, where is my suggested paper here? Ah, here's, here's my suggested paper. It's a classic. We it was the first reading from last year, so I'm cheating in a way. 
but it's, it's a classic paper. It, it actually best describes the things that we're going to be talking about here. Um, but that we're going to be discussing in the course, not discussing here. Right, so, but uh, in terms of um, the sco scoping of how we're going to select these papers, that we're, what we're saying is it has to be a square publication, right? Meaning that it has to be peer reviewed, right? And in, preferably in, in a reputable publication venue, right? By reputable, no predatory journals, please. Um, we, yeah, it's a serious thing, right? I worked with a group of fourth years last time and they had uh, references in, in their proposal that were from a predatory journal and we had a long discussion about predatory journals, right? Um, there's an easier way I'll show us, there's an easier way of identifying whether a, a venue is reputable. For journals, you look at the impact factor, for instance, right? Um, yeah, uh, for conferences, you look at the, the editorial, right? Telltale signs, huh? if you, you see that a journal is from, and I'm sorry I'm using Nigeria as an example, it's from Nigeria and everyone who is part of the, the committee, the board, is from Nigeria, then that's a bad sign right there, right? The expectation is you're supposed to have uh, people from elsewhere, like the local journals that we have, like Zadish, for instance, I know that uh, we have people from I think Namibia and South Africa and all that, yeah. So you already know that uh, uh, this thing maybe it's mid tier, maybe low tier, but still it's a it's a reputable venue, right? So yeah, uh, we have to make sure that the paper that we are suggesting is relevant to the topics that we would have covered. So um, there will be no suggesting in a tracking paper when we haven't yet discussed discuss the computer network thing. Right? So for the person who's going to be suggesting a paper after me, um, the next talk is networking, but it would have to be based on information system. It would have to be a general information systems paper. Right? The other thing to look at here is, it doesn't make sense for us to, to, to look at something that was published in the 90s. Right? We want to look at the state of the art. What are people talking about insofar as information system like for this topic is concerned, right? Now I know I'm a bad example because what I've suggested is, um, a, this is a classic though, but it's a paper that was um, authored in 1979, right? But it's a classic anyway, and seeing as like a trial, so it's, it's fine, I suppose. But we want, and there's a lot being published now. There's, I don't see why you would want to pick a paper that was published in 2014 when there are conferences and journals that are published left, right, and center, like almost, I mean, regularly, right? Um, so anyway. <coughs> um, and then in terms of, uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, the reading session itself, we'll, we'll be dedicating at least maybe 15 to 20 minutes in every session. So what we do is uh, the person who has suggested the paper will just give a short summary about why they suggested the paper, and what the paper is about. Of course, we would have all read and you know, discovered what the paper is about, but it just gives us a summary of the paper. And then we take turns in, in just trying to chip in on what we thought, uh, some of the interesting things about the paper, um, things that we could potentially have done better had we been the ones who had written the paper, for instance, right? Fundamental flaws in the paper, if you notice that there's something wrong with the paper, those are things that we're interested in. Uh, and believe me, maybe you won't pick this up right away, but it's, it's going to be helpful once you get to phase two, which is next year, right? Uh, because one of the things you're going to have to do is come up with that chapter two, right? And in chapter two, we involve you hunting for papers, for instance, right? So um, if we do this, let's say uh, we have what? Maybe we're supposed to have 15 weeks of teaching in this term and 15 um, next, next term. So if we do this 30 times, it's going to be less, maybe 20 times, you notice that we'll become really good at going through this process of looking for a paper and dissecting it, right? So much just that by the time you're writing your related work chapter, it'll be just be a breeze, right? I assure you. I think this is going to be very helpful. Suffice to say that what we'll be, what we'll be looking at is a topic that might not be related to what you're going to cover. In, when you do the research component, right? Maybe you'll be doing records management, but what we're doing here is like papers on information systems, networking, digital libraries, information retrieval, right? Okay. 
All right, and then some, some few pointers that I have. I don't know if I mentioned Mendeley last time. Um, so you see, when you're taking these summaries, assuming we're going to do this, let's say, assuming we'll do it 30 times, it's, it really doesn't make sense for you to, every time you print out the paper, and then you go home, maybe over a sap or something, you are reading and then you are annotating. That's what people do, right? Now, I'll tell you the truth here. I've not done that in a very long time, what all of you are doing. Which is why if you see my handwriting, it's horrible. I find it really hard to write, actually. I always have, um, I always have this thing open, a text, um, a text editor, right? And I always move around with either my computer or my phone, right? And uh, sometimes I'll have to tell people up front to say, I'm not checking my phone, I'm taking notes, actually. Uh, it's easier for me, anyway, but it's, it's fine. If that works for you, it's fine. But uh, take our point here, there is a computer-based information system called Mendeley, right? And what Mendeley, I don't know how many of us have heard about Mendeley. Yeah. What Mendeley is, it's, it's called, sometimes it's called a paper management system, right? It's also classified as a bibliographic management system, right? What it does is it allows you to keep track of the different things that you might be reading, for instance. It has cool features like you can, oh, you can annotate my fault. Hmm. Is it that there's no power? It's a power, is it? Yeah. I thought it was me. It's a power, right? Ah, oh, no, it's not a power. It's, it must have been me. I think that thing is loose. Or maybe it was the power and just came back. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's also classed as a bibliographic management system, right? Um, you, you might not necessarily want to use it for annotating like I'm suggesting here, but at some stage, um, what it does is, uh, uh, for those of us that have used this, I think you know, um, it allows you to automatically reference and cite um, things, right? So as you are writing that dissertation or the proposal, instead of manually doing things or using um, ineffective uh, tools like, uh, I know Microsoft Word has that feature, you can use Mendeley or Zotero to do that, right? Um, you just install a plugin, a Mendeley plugin, um, a Mendeley Word plugin, and then you automatically do that. Word. I wish I could, uh, I could show us how this, this is done. It's always nice to kind of do this, I guess, but. And, and uh, I'm doing this because I didn't install it beforehand, so as we're talking about this, I will attempt to install this so that we look at it at some stage. It, it would be nice if I showed you exactly how the annotation feature actually gets to work. It's a really nifty feature, I like it myself. Um, incidentally, I have uh, almost 800 plus documents in my, in my my Mendeley, associated with my Mendeley account because I've been using Mendeley since 2011, right? So all the things that I've done, um, when I'm reading, I just put things here and I annotate them, right? The, the other cool thing is that, so if, I don't have Mendeley here, right? But um, I don't have Mendeley here, but once I install it, right? Once, once I install it, uh, so about that. Once I install it here, <coughs> I will automatically pull everything that I have in my main database because it's synced to the cloud automatically, which is a cool feature. I mean, everybody is using the cloud now, right? These slides, I prepare them using Google Slides because then I know that I always have a backup of what I'm doing, right? I don't use uh, Microsoft Word or LibreOffice as often as I used to. I just use Google Docs now, anyway. So. Uh, yeah, so you want to look into this, it will, it will be helpful actually. The sooner you start using this, the better, because by the time you're writing that proposal, you'd have figured out how to use this tool, right? And I'll show us exactly how it works, just, oh, there we go. Spark, let me just see if, it'd be nice if I could uh, also show us how the, the word plugin works, um, just so we can get an appreciation of, Um, so one of the reasons I bring up uh, some of these things 
by the way, is because most, most of the things that we are, most of these things or the skills that are, are going to be required of us once we get to phase two are learned through osmosis. Now, this, Dr. Agakandira, I promise you, will not even, maybe will, but it's rare that you, when you are, we are, you are going through the, uh, the research methods course here, 5010, he will rarely talk about some of these things, right? So usually it's, it's helpful when you're interacting with senior students, right? Those that are doing the research component right now because they'll give you pointers of what things have worked for them, right? Or sometimes in these other courses, lecturers will, uh, Uh, lecturers will probably throw in, uh, oh, finally, it's, it's work. They will, so I, I don't have anything right now in here, but what I will do is I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you something that might be useful. You notice this thing, oh, sorry, but that, this thing is, uh, this, this animation here is signaling the fact that it's pulling information from the cloud of Mercury right now. But uh, I'll show you some features that I think you might find useful here. Um, so I just installed the web plugin just now. Um, so if I, if I was writing a document, for instance, and because I don't have anything in here, I'll just randomly add uh, a file from downloads, let me say. Boom. Just, just I, I guess I'm trying to motivate you to actually get to do this. Uh, it automatically figures out what the paper is about. You see, I just imported it and it picks the metadata from the PDF document, obviously, and I think they crawl the first page to check for things like the title and the authors, right, which is why I have uh, this thing already identified like that. So look at what happens. If, let's say I was writing a document like like this, I'm writing this document and it's my proposal, right? And um, my supervisor is Dr. Kandela. Uh, um, and I have the introduction here. And I write something like that. Um, one of the hallmarks of Mendeley is instead of, I don't know how people do it, but I don't know how it's done in Wade, but one of the things, cool things Mendeley does is I want to cite something and I'll just use a plugin like that. Um, and I want to cite these authors here, right? Done, I've cited these authors, right? And then I'll just tell it to say, what might I generate my bibliography? Done, right? Even, even cooler is I can specify to say, because a place like Unza obsesses about the fact that you must use Harvard referencing, I can already configure this thing to say, use Harvard referencing format, use the style, right? Um, and then I'll come here and, and just refresh, hopefully. Is this already Harvard, I wonder? Let's change it to something like uh, IEEE, I guess. I use this, I'll use this style. Let's say okay. No. Okay, let's try, let's try, uh, let's try Apple or something and see if this works. I'm wondering why it's not working. Ideally, it's supposed to work. I don't know why it's not working. Um, it's supposed to work and then it automatically does um, everything for you, so it changes. I don't know if this is changing or not. Is this, it's still the same, is it? I triple E. Okay, selected. Oh, there we go. So you notice that it just changed to IEEE, right? So you don't have to, and, and you might downplay this, right? <laughs> but I've, I've interacted with people, like I, I know I know someone who was uh, writing the, the PhD manuscript. Uh, we are on the same floor, and so they, 
they came through and said, I need help with my references, I need to submit this, right? And I can't, so, uh, uh, one of the comments from the examiners was that some of my references have missing cite corresponding citations, right? I need help. And my immediate question was, how were you doing this? It was manual, right? Which is why I missed it all. So it's, it's a, I mean, it's a, I, I, I encourage you to just play around with Zotero or Mendele. It will really save you a lot, especially for the purposes of what, what we're doing. Look at this. So I'm reading this paper, for instance, right? And I get to a stage where I think this is something that would be worth uh, discussing with the rest of the group, like when we have a paper reading session. I can highlight a particular point and then just add a note, for instance, right? Um, once I add that note, it will be automatically synced to the cloud. So once I access my Mendel account using a different machine, I'll have access to this note, right? Um, so anyway, you come through, you come with your computer, and then you're reading out the annotations, right? You don't have to remember from memory or annotate in the book, but hey. Yes, Mendel. Yes, it's freely available, actually. It's free, 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 freely available. It also has um, a bookmarklet, so when you're browsing in the browser and you find an interesting article, you just say add to Mendel and then it adds that automatically to your Mendel um, account, which is useful anyway. Now in terms of potential publication venues where we can find um, potential papers to suggest as, as reading material, there are plenty of sources, right? The number one source here is Google Scholar. All of us have used Google Scholar here, right? I think I, we don't have to talk about Google Scholar. And I'm sorry, you should tell me if I don't have to talk about some of these things, right? But the other specific venues that um, are more inclined towards, um, I guess, library information science in general, and more specifically some of the topics that we're going to cover. And you notice that for, for certain topics, right, things like uh, digital libraries and information retrieval especially, these are, these are um, topics that you will find in fields like computer science, uh, not just library information science, right? So you want to pay particular attention. So when you're hunting for potential papers to read, for instance, uh, when it comes to information retrieval and digital libraries, remember that there are certain publication venues, and I know some of them that are more computer science related, although you do have people with library information science backgrounds that um, will suggest reading there. Uh, so things like, I. Um, um, ICADO, International Conference, is it ICADO? I can't remember the acronym, but it's, uh, oh, International Conference of Asian Pacific Digital Libraries, right, TPDL. Um, it's a combination of both computer science and, and library information science, but hey, um, we should maybe, maybe uh, it would be nice if maybe as a group we start, we come up with a, a curated list of, let's say if you find an interesting place where you've picked a suggested reading, we'll come up with a spreadsheet that will be populating, I guess, so that we, we use it maybe for the next group coming, so we don't have to redo the same thing over and over again, right? This is a classic, I've used a lot of, I've referred to a lot of material from d magazine, right? Really nice, uh, there are things like Journals of American Society and Information Science, and um, incidentally, I, I picked up some of these, these potential publication venues from this classic write-up here where uh, people have um, what they think are classic papers to do with uh, digital libraries, library information science. So you might want to, to visit that. It, it was a DLib article, actually. But hey. Uh, but, but the list is endless here. I mean, um, if you are uh, subscribed to those, those sites that will notify you if there's a conference that is upcoming, for instance, and you specify the field, you will realize that there are so many different venues, right? Um, but I guess part of the training we're receiving is to identify which venues you think are going to be appropriate for what we're doing, right? It's going to be very important once you start doing your related work chapter, which you chapter actually in the thesis, right? So for Google Scholar, I mean, we know the obvious things here. When you go to Google Scholar, things like uh, you look at, when you're, you're searching for papers, right, for a particular field, let's say we're covering computer networking, and you just come here and search for a networking problem, what will signal that a paper is worth reading, right, besides the fact that we said that we don't want to read old papers, so we know that Google Scholar has 
a feature that allows us to specify the year, right? So you can just specify, so you're looking for papers that were published from 2016 to 2019, for instance. Um, pay particular attention to things like the number of citations, right? If more people have cited that paper, then you know that it has to be interesting. But of course, you just don't go there and you search and then you say, I'm suggesting this. You want to quickly go through it and vet it. That's it's part of your task is, if you are the one suggesting the paper, you quickly go through the paper and decide to say, I think this is reading material for the reading session, right? You know. Um, <laughs> another technique to use, by the way, is uh, for Google Scholar, right? You can. You can go to a profile like, uh, like uh, Mrs. Makondo's profile, for instance, in Google Scholar or Dr. Kandira's profile, and because you know that they're in this field, you look at where are they publishing their work in, right? If they're publishing their work in certain venues, like if you go to, this is what I mean here. Oh, we went, we came here, sorry. Uh, what's your computer number? I'm sorry, uh, pause for a little while. I want to see if this works. If it works for him, then we know that uh, this thing works. It's misbehaving as well. As, as we're waiting for that, we will go to, hmm, something went wrong. I don't know what went wrong here. As we're waiting here, we'll go to uh, Google Scholar and uh, Yes. It says the session about the next week. Oh, it's Thursday, then it's stayed. Sorry, my mistake. It's supposed to be Thursday. It's supposed to be Wednesday. My mistake. I apologize for that. Yeah, it's stayed. Sorry, my fault. Yes, it's stayed. We'll be dedicating uh, just a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes or three hours. Anyway, I'm having trouble with the internet here, but. I think we know that in Google Scholar, you can, you can also rank, you can also see the ranking of the most highly cited people at UNSA, for instance, right? Yeah, you know, something to look at here. <laughs> All right, so there are certain places, like you want to go to A minor, right? An eight minor, they used to call it. Um, you can actually, the, the cool thing about an eight minor is that it, it actually ranks different conferences by field, right? So if you're interested in library information science, or if when we're dis discussing computer net net networks, networking and it's your turn to suggest a paper you can just use a minor and come and rank conferences to do with networking and then just quickly see what interesting papers have come out of the most highly rated conference if it's highly rated then you know that the quality of work published in there is really good right and then obviously we cannot have this discussion without uh, talking about some potential venues local venues we have here right so the Zambia ICT journal, I'm specifically putting it out there because it is used, the Zambia ICT journal, it is used by people uh, with library information science background, uh, computer science and engineering, right? So if you look at, uh, not the most recent issue, but the issue before the most recent one, there are people actually from the library. I don't know, is it, is it Chewe? Yeah, he submitted something there, right? So. You might want to poke around there and see if there's maybe something that you might find interesting as well. It gives you a sense of really looking at what people are doing locally as well, right? By the way, one of the reasons you want to do this is you want to get a sense of what sort of problems people are working on. Perhaps you draw inspiration for what you might end up working towards next year, right? Um, so, perhaps, so next week, what you are basically saying, after we do the, the talk, we're having a talk, isn't it, with uh, some consultants? Yes. Um, now, actually, the thing with the talk, right, what I'm attempting to do is, I do not want us to eat so much into, and I'm sorry, I think I mentioned this, I don't want, uh, last time, I don't want us to eat so much into our lecture time. So what I'm proposing we do is we have the talks on a Thursday, and I checked our timetable. We, we have a, a window between 16 and 18. We can choose what time we think we'd be able to. Can we make it then? Not the whole two hours, but anywhere between 16 and 18. The 16 to 18 on Thursday is because of the venue, number one, and also because of the people that we're going to potentially invite. It's a perfect time for someone who wakes to come during that time, right? And for the venue, we've. We've managed to secure the library auditorium, sadly, for that period. And I was actually looking at your 
I was looking at your timetables when I was thinking about this, try and see. And I think we have a class on a Thursday, right? Yes. So I knew that you would be on campus A, and B, I knew that the venue would be available, and the time is perfect for most people that would be able to invite. Ah, okay. Yeah. So after five. It's after five, it's fine. But this we can see in the afternoon then, that's afternoon. Okay, so you're saying a Thursday five to six then? Yes. Tentatively. Okay, can I, can I say this? I will leave it up to the group because there are some people that are not here. I will leave it up to the group to decide to say maybe Thursday after f between five and six. Not. Maybe for some talks we can have them come through during this period, but the venue is a problem. Because what we're planning to do is, for some of these talks, right, for someone from Ciders, for instance, we're extending the invitation to other people, so it won't just be this class. Um, we'll have other people that will be invited to come, so we need a slightly larger venue. Uh, but so, so first we have talk 14. Yes, I looked at the venue, so, but the question was, because of the venue, we know the venue is secured between four and five and six. six but we can yeah and six so the question is what would we be comfortable with 16 to 17 16 30 to 17 30 17 to 17 30 17 30 to 18 but probably 17 30 between 17 and 18 or 16 to 17. okay thanks uh and of course i forgot to include ladies and gentlemen i forgot to include our very own source right the unza institutional repository especially on there's no harm in you going to the UNSA institutional repository and say, oh, I found this interesting paper in the repository that was done by a researcher here at UNSA. I think it would be perfect for us to discuss it, right? Why not, right? We should do that. And also, I wanted to, a shameless plug again, we have, um, and it's here now. We have, uh, we also have, um, we have our very own uh, institutional repository, right? Which is here. So if you are interested in, not that, not that we'll discuss a, a fourth year report, but in case you're just interested, we also have a, a subject repository um, uh, where we, we specifically archive, so we archive uh, work that has been done by our fourth year students, right? Um, so in case you're interested, this is the link here. Uh, It's always nice to just, you see, what this does, by the way, is uh, it will give you a sense of what the, the now 13 faculty staff in the least department are doing. And you want to do that because one of the things you're going to have to do is maybe cover out your, um, your potential research topic in such a way that it, it aligns towards what people in the department are interested in. It's the perfect way of trying to get a sense of what people are doing in the department, actually. Because uh, lecturers will typically suggest topics at fourth year, and they suggest topics in areas they're interested in. So you notice, like people like Crispin and uh, and uh, yeah, Crispin, I suppose, uh, will typically be more inclined towards records management, right? All the projects that he supervised uh, last year, he knows records management. Right? So anyway, thought I'd say that as well. Um, yeah, the ranking I was referring to is if you go to some, some place like Unza here, you can see a ranking of different people, I think we spoke about this, but we wanted to look at uh, uh, Dr. Kandela, yeah, there we go. So with Dr. Kandela, what, what I was referring to is, so if you look at this paper, for instance, his most highly cited paper was from 12, 2012, right? So you, you tell yourself, oh, wait a minute, is the journal, of, the British Journal of Visual Impairment, is it a least type of journal? Perhaps not, but maybe, maybe this, right? If he, if he publishes there, then there must be something special. Maybe you, you, you might be uh, one of those people who is keen on suggesting a paper that is specific um, to problems that afflict Africa, right? So you want to go to venues like this, right? Um, so you can even arrange this in ye according to year to see where Dr. Kande was recently published. So Journal of Hospital Librarianship, the International Journal of Multidisciplinary Research, you know, so anyway, this should help you you know, do that, I guess. <clears throat> All right. Um, 
um, before before my shameless plug here, let me just finish this off. Uh, so so when I started my postgraduate research journey, um, I found these. These are, I mean, just two of many things that I read, but I, I thought these were quite useful. This might not be very important for you, but they were quite help in helping me, because I remember I always like telling this story. The first time I, um, <laughs> my, my first meeting with my supervisor, right, he gave me this book, said, go and read this book, I want us to come and discuss this book, right? Um, and because I was still doing registration, so the agreement was once you're done with registration, obviously let's meet in two weeks' time, right? I spent that two weeks reading the entire book and the references as well, right? And I remember him laughing, right? Um, because I didn't know, it was my first time actually going through academic literature. Uh, the Department of Computer Science, I did a software engineering um, degree and the emphasis was not really on the experimentation and science, not really on research, it was requirements collection or elicitation and then you build an artifact, that's it, right? Um, so reading like a, a scholarly piece of work that is grounded in science was something that was really new to me. And so I went on a tirade of trying to uh, look at, you know, work that would help me understand paper. So I, you know, how to read a paper, how to read a computer science paper. I even read a book called How to Read a Book, right? You might want to look that up. I thought that was really interesting. It really helped, you know. Um, <laughs> but just to mention that some of the things that you find the obvious things, I think you know these things, right? I mean, uh, abstract, you know, the title, the introduction, these are all obvious things. Some of them are optional, like implementation. This is mostly to do with uh, more technical, I guess, fields like computer science, but even, even our field, actually. Um, the fourth year students, the one group I worked with last year, came up with the implementation of that subject repository that I was talking about. I mean, they didn't implement anything, but they set it up and configured it, right? <coughs> but, uh, so this, this paper here describes, uh, it's, it's actually Kesha who describes the three pass process that I have found really useful. I, if, if I'm not very familiar with the paper, I always go through these three passes, right? So the first pass is I'll quickly run through the title, abstract, and introduction, and then I scan through the, the sections of the subsections, right? After I do that, the outcome is always uh, that I know what the, the type of paper I'm reading, right? I know the context, the problem they're trying to solve, and more importantly, I know the novel contribution of the authors of the paper, right? And then I go through a second pass, which is more in-depth, where I'll go through with their graphs and visual representation, I'll go through those things, uh, look at some key references associated with the paper to try and see if I might need to read them to understand the paper further, right? Or really, more importantly, to try and see if there, there's anything of value that is different from the references that you're citing. Because usually, you will cite gaps in existing literature when you're writing a paper, is it? And then the final, the final pass really is just to verify what I've already done, right? At this stage, I've, I've really understood what the paper is about. It's a, in fact, I'll be in a position to to tell someone what the paper is about without really looking at the paper, right? Which is what we want to do during those discussions, especially if the, you are the one leading the discussion, right? So th this might not be useful to you, but I found it useful myself, right? <coughs> so my suggested paper is, as we may think, um, I think it's going to be a wonderful discussion um, next on the third. I, I had the fourth as a seminar talk because I assumed it's going to be a Thursday, by the way, so, so but the third is a reading session. All right, uh, can I go through my shameless plug now uh, the, to give us a sense of what to expect when people are giving these talks, right? If, if, unless if there are any questions with regards to what I spoke about. I thought this would be important to be fair, especially that there are marks associated with these paper readings, it would have been unfair for us to just say, or you come up with the summaries without really uh, talking about what we expect, right? Or what is expected. And if you people want, I think there's no harm in sharing the summaries, right? Unless if people object, once we come up with the sum summaries, right? The written summaries before the discussions, maybe we can also circulate what people have summarized so that we have an idea as to what each one of us was, was thinking about when writing the summaries. All right, so my shameless plug, I will quickly run us through, we only have a few minutes, but this is perfect. I'll quickly run us through um, something we did last year. Um, and it's, 
it's I don't know if some of you have sat in presentations where I've done this, but it's it's something that I'm I'm really passionate about, and it's this notion of um, <coughs> of um, visibility of um, online visibility of square output in in Zambia, right? <laughs> it's bad, right? We know this. I don't know. <coughs> so the the motivation really stems from the fact that. Um, it's, it's, it's quite shocking, really. Apparently, did we know this? Zambia has, uh, last time we checked, 66 institutions of higher learning universities, right? So entities that offer a minimum of degree qualification, or a maximum, at least a degree qualification, right? 66. Out of 66, six of them are uh, so-called public HEIs, right? Um, this is the thing here. Is Zika's public or, it's public, it's public, right? So then we have more than that, because the six was there before, I think it was before Zika's became Zika's University. Now Zika's University has changed, right? No, they are two. Sorry? Yeah, two. 60? No, 66. Yes. But, but I'm curious about Zika's. Is it, it's Zika's University now, right? Okay, so you're public, then you should be part of, so instead of, it should be seven public institutions of Harlini. Huh? And, uh, and 59 private university. Mm, 59, right? that's a lot. Now the, the thing is that, so we have all these funny entities, right? 60 of them, but if you look at the corresponding visibility of square output, right? Publications is what we're referring to, because part of the expectation of these entities, especially these funded, public, as she rightly put it, thank you for reminding us, public funded universities, Part of the expectation is that people there must conduct research, right? In fact, research that is relevant to this entity we call Zambia, right? You do your research, you publish so that people know. In fact, you publish so that the relevant um, organizations out there, or government ministries, benefit from whatever studies you'd have conducted, right? <laughs> but the problem is, if you, there's little being done, or at least as far as we're concerned, there's, there's, there's very little online visibility of whatever is being done at these entities, right? Um, so the other motivation is that because of that, right, it's one of the reasons why we have such gory um, statistics, right? I don't know if you can see this, right? It is sad, I always, I feel sad. I was telling another group uh, yesterday, actually, I was giving a similar talk to our CSC 50, 57 foot one course, right? I was telling them, um, we have a similar setup, by the way, we have paper reading sessions and seminars, and we're doing our trial yesterday, so this is perfect for me. I was telling them that whenever I look at this, I feel, I feel sad. And you know how sometimes, even if you, you're, you're the one who hasn't done something wrong, you know how you, you bow down in shame, right? When someone is, maybe you're presenting and they're not doing a good job, and you look down because you feel ashamed. I feel like that whenever I'm talking about this. This is sad, right? Statistics like, oh, the University of Zambia is number 3,395 on the world stage, right? Uh, Murugushi University number 14,381, right? We don't know if the picture has changed. This, this was taken a few months ago. Right? But the bottom line is that even if we were to get a, a new snapshot, I, don't, I think very little has changed. We're still in the thousands, right? Shouldn't be the case, right? <coughs> and really, if you, you actually go and look at these other um, um, uh, portals and uh, information, computer-based information systems that archive Square output from around the world, the picture is still the same, right? So the the NDOTD portal, for instance, union catalog houses uh, dissertations from across the world, right? So masters and PhD dissertations, they harvest this, con this content automatically from universities from around the world. If you look at the representation of uh, entities like Zambia, it's sad, really. But we graduate what? A ton of master's students, right? Like in any given year, UNSA, for instance, will say we have graduated, you know, but where are they, right? They're not there. <laughs> now, uh, an interesting, I guess, visual representation, I like using this. This is perfect, actually. If you look at the, the world stage, and you notice that my title is tagged as um, Global South. The Global South here, I'm looking at the developing world, I suppose, so entities like countries in Africa, for instance, right? <laughs> if you look at this, this, um, this chart here, it's showing you the distribution of electronic thesis and dissertation in the world by continent, right? And then by country. Now, if you haven't figured it out, 
left is good, top is good, right? So as you're moving from left to right, it's showing you that the proportion is decreasing. Europe has the most online dissertations, followed by North America. And then top is good, so followed by South America and then Asia, right? And then you have places like, and now Africa is that small little thing, at the, we're always at the end here, sadly. Uh, <laughs> it's sad really, but hey. <coughs> Uh, if you compare the size of Africa in terms of like proportional number of countries and compare it with, I guess, maybe the likes of North America, for instance, it shouldn't be the case. If you drill down into Africa, really, you, you notice that most of the dissertations here are coming from South Africa, actually, right? This is South Africa, right? Um, and then at least Zambia is somewhere there, it's appearing, but still, right? this is not enough. So this was our motivation. So we set out to kind of empirically determine, you know, how much of this square output is actually online. Um, and by online, our definition of online is we're trying to get a sense of um, what, what sort of content do these institutions of higher learning in Zambia have on their institutional repositories or whatever platform they use, right? And so what we set out to do is um, we first of all, oh, so another, Another goal was to not just identify that there's a problem, but suggest tools that we could use to try and solve this problem anyway. So what we did was we, we, we went to all these 66 institutions of learning, and we actually tried to figure out which one of them um, have institutional repositories and actually have uh, square output on their websites. Right? It's kind of easy. Most of them will have like a publications page um, it could be a link to the IR itself, like ones and CBU. Uh, it could, could be just a publications page with a list of publications. Um, in other talks I've used, uh, and I feel bad, I've used Zambia Open University as an example, where they have a publications page, but when you click on that, there's nothing there, right? <laughs> there's nothing. But the most prominent page, or the, the page that's, that's updated frequently is the, the payment methods thing, right? It, that's always up to date, like bank details and all that. So what we, what, what we did was we used the OIPMH protocol, which I'll discuss this protocol when you look at digital libraries, and we also use the OAIORE protocol. So we use this to harvest the metadata, which is the descriptive content associated with the, the publications of the digital objects in the IRs, right? So by descriptive metadata, I think you know this, we, we are saying each, each, each entity in the IR has uh, metadata to do with who was the author, and I'll talk about this anyway the title and the subject it falls under and all that. We, we use this product, protocol to, to harvest the PDF documents, right? Um, and then finally we, we just highlighted, um, um, this, was, this was actually in a paper that we published, but um, I'm also going to talk about some, some tooling strategies that we think can be used to try and solve this problem, right? So in terms of the content analysis associated with the OIPMH protocol, this is just a representation of the descriptive metadata I'm talking about, right? Dublin Core 15 elements here. I think we know these people from the library, right? Our discussion of digital libraries is in part going to involve Dublin Core, by the way. Um, so this is, these are the things we were interested in, right? The descriptive metadata here. <laughs> and specifically, um, the type as well, because the type tag tells you what type of um, object it is, right? So we harvest and then we process, right? So we harvested the metadata and the PDF documents and then we process them. By processing, we're just trying to make sense out of the different tags that were there, right? So some interesting results, right? Of the six, now it should be seven here. Of the seven uh, public institutions of higher learning, only two have repositories. And of the two, it's sad really, uh, only UNSA has been consistent here. And even though they've been consistent, we, we can do better this, right? CBU at some stage, you'll notice from this graph here, they stopped depositing in 2014, right? So the, the repository is pretty much dead, which explains why they only have, at this, at the time we're doing this, they only had about 168 objects, right? Um, <coughs> what we also notice, uh, and you can see this from the graph is, uh, so, Entities like the UNSA, for instance, are not really consistent when it comes to depositing content into the repository. Um, 
we, uh, as part of what we did with a, another group of fourth year students, we had them go to the library and conduct uh, interviews with the unit that is concerned with this. And we discovered that uh, there's virtually no self-archiving at UNSA, right? So people, there are some people that archive content on their own, but to use dissertations as an example, um, when you graduate, for instance, you write that dissertation, this is another shock here, DRGS will tell you to say, put the dissertation on CD, right? And then you take it to DRGS. Once DRGS finishes with the backlog of whatever it is they have there, they will take your CD to the library, right? The library has a unit of, how many people work on the on depositing content into the repository? Three, two. There you go, there's a problem here. And I think this is what explains this. They went through this process, the students worked it. So they take those CDs to the two people. Now, now depositing content into the repository by those two people is not an easy feat, right? Because part of what they have to do, you take the CD there, that CD does not have a description of what subject categories that thing falls under. So the librarians, the people responsible for that, those two people have to read the abstract and identify which Library of Cong Congress tags those things for under, right? And then they deposit it. Now, depositing this content in the repository, again, takes a bit of time. Typically, it takes you about five minutes actually going through, almost five minutes. And a person who uses that a lot, right? So this explains why, I mean, if you look at the, the really the a comparison of the ingestion date, like when the content was deposited and when it was published, you notice that it's done in batches, right? That's the problem there. So, some of the dissertations that were done in 2018 have not yet been uploaded. Yeah, and the problem is they keep them longer, maybe a year or two, so yeah. at the postgraduate People don't realize the implications of doing that. Now, if you are a supervisor that's supervising a dissertation like that, um, it's entirely possible that that person cited you, maybe your way, if, if the dissertation is based on a field that you're interested in. If they did that, you get points, it's a citation, right? If you get a citation, it has implication on this thing we are calling the H-index, and where they talk about the H-index, right? Now, if you delay that process, your H-index won't go up, right? Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, so what we noticed was that really um, because and I'm, I'm curious, I don't know if these two people actually, they're probably not subject librarians. They're not, uh, I don't know if they're very familiar with the intricate details of specific fields at UNSA, like computer science. Do they know which vocabulary, controlled vocabulary set is used for computer science? Well, the, the catalogers. Yeah. But then the challenge is, uh, like you're saying, we're supposed to have more than two people. Right. Because at times they can't, was it just a Oh, by the way, this thing worked finally, right? Uh, 2018, 24, 61, 51. So, so I'll show, I'll show you, I'll show you some of the the drawbacks of of not having a controlled vocabulary set, right? And I think you know this as as expert librarians here. You notice that if you're not consistent in how you are tagging content, right? There's a lot of, if you look at the, the UNSA institution repository, for instance, there's a lot of things in there, right? And because there, and this thing is not, maybe I'll just use this as an example. If you're not properly tagging it, the things, people cannot easily browse for content, right? Uh, and this is a good example, our subject repository is a good example because we're very careful about tagging, right? So we know that if someone wanted, was interested in records management and he clicks here, he will get an appropriate list with those subject, subjects that are interested. Look at this, the ones, right? Can you use the exam as a subject? Second semester as a subject, I don't know the exam. Natural sciences, why would you use this as a, come on, man. Uh, it's, um, it's, it makes it hard for people to find information. And you might don't play this anyway, but I'm sure there are implications in, in how you know, people are able to easily find information here, right? It's not properly tagged, you know. But, but yeah, so this was one of the things we noticed, right? You notice some of the things that have been adult education. 2014 is a subject, sad. Um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. 
And, and what we noticed as well is, uh, I think because you have two people, and Dublin Core has 15 elements, and in fact you use qualified Dublin Core, so those things are repeatable, right? What, what they have done is they've prioritized um, metadata elements that they are, they are tagging with those documents. And so what we realized was that there are important metadata elements that are missing in most of these documents. And this has implications on um, findability or discoverability of information, right? Uh, not only that, for certain important uh, metadata tags like the type, you see those aggregate services that we looked at like uh, this, oatd.org. They depend on that type tag to classify whether the content is a thesis or a dissertation. If you don't correctly classify those things, they will not harvest all your ETDs. As a result, people will think that you are not being productive. And in actual fact, you're just not being careful when it comes to tagging this content. Right? Um, <laughs> obviously, this is a well-known fact here. Submission, I mean, self-archiving is almost non-existent, right? So, DRIGS has to take your dissertation on your behalf. When you can actually, they can create credentials and you can log in and upload it yourself, right? It gets even worse, right? Even faculty staff do that. Uh, I've met people who say, I need help with, uh, with uploading this thing on the repository, so I have to go to the library and you, you walk all the way to the library and you take your things on flash, right? Come on. Well, <laughs> but it, it, all that is a problem, right? Because those people are busy by the time they're uploading your content. Maybe someone who's writing a piece of work that is related to your work would have cited you, but they won't be able to cite you because your work was not online, right? Now, I know there are workarounds. You can upload your work elsewhere, like academia.edu, researchgate, which is what I do. I replicate things. In fact, I have a publications page on my personal blog. I have a publications page on my my uh, Unza web page as well, right? So I, you'll find copies of my work all over the place, right? So in terms of like things that we're proposing, so far as uh, increasing visibility is concerned, are these things here. Electronic journals. So we've been, we are part of um, a group of people that is working towards ensuring that um, the so-called official UNSA journals go online. You'll be shocked. None of the seven official journals at UNSA are online. They are all print-based, right? You don't do that. I mean, people used to do that 100 years ago, right? If you stick to, and, and there, there are people, there are always people on opposing sides. There's people that still think, no, we should still have print-based journals because that's the only way we can make money. Come on. How many people are really going to buy? How much money are you really making from, from journals, right? <laughs> you know, so we are, we are proposing electronic journals and we, we've already gone a step further, right? So we are part of a team. Just recently we helped the school of um, veterinary medicine to set up an electronic journal. They are willing to go online. They'll be going online soon. They were telling us that the next issue is going to be online, right? We, we have also done that with our ZAG list. So the, the next issue of ZAG list is uh, Zambia Journal of Library Information Science. Uh, it's an initiative in the department. It's going to be online, right? The platform is already accessible there. Um, these are all initiatives that we think can help increase the visibility. And to just showcase how this is done, so an example is the ICT, Zambia ICT journal that I showed you. Because they use a platform um, uh, that facilitates um, you know, indexing of content on platforms like Google Scholar, people can easily find content in that journal, right? Um, we're also suggesting that we decentralize this whole process. We can do this by implementing subjects repositories, right? We've already showed that this is possible by implementing a subject repository in LIS ourselves, right? Uh, so I worked with these students uh, as part of their fourth year project, they work towards uh, trying to ascertain if it's feasible for us to do this. And we've shown that it's feasible because we have um, our subject repository currently running, right? The beauty with this is uh, it's a, it's a two-way process. We can push content to the main user repository and we can pull content from the main user repository, which is what we're doing. Because our, the faculty staff in the department take their, or upload their uh, um, square works on the UNSA main repository, so we just harvest content from, from the least department collection automatically, right? And then very soon we're pushing the projects, the fourth year projects automatically to the UNSA repository because the UNSA repository has, it has a, a section four for uh, student projects. Unfortunately, if you filter through, these are the student projects right here. Uh, where are they? Here. 
So all fourth year projects from engineering, School of Natural Sciences go in here. But you notice that the, the School of Education, and this in particular has been behind. So if you go in the School of Education and specifically go to and try and search to see if there's anything from this, nothing. The last thing was from 2015, right? The people from the fourth years from School of Education do what I think are interesting projects, but no one bothers to put them on. I don't know why. Maybe people are ashamed of the project. Their students work on. I don't know. I'm not ashamed. I put them online. Right? It's part of the learning process. I worked with a group that didn't really do a very good job. If you read their report, it's, it's full of flaws and mistakes. But I put them online nonetheless, right? Um, and then we're suggesting downstream uh, services as well, right? Uh, we're trying to work towards something similar to what is done around the world. Like, so there are national ETD portals. So South Africa is an example. They have a platform or a portal that aggregates or archives dissertations from all the universities across South Africa in one central location. We're trying to do the same. We've, we're already there, right? We have a, a, a demonstration that showcases the fact that this can work. Uh, and we think that this is important because, number one, it will prevent duplication of work, right? Like right now, because we don't know what the people at CBU are doing, it's entirely possible that someone at UNSA is working on a thesis that has been done at CBU. And in fact, maybe they've plagiarized, right? Now, I won't beat about the bush. I don't know if I talked about this example, about a person from Leeds, a student. Did I share this? Yes. Yes, yeah. We can prevent this if, if stuff is online, people will be able to see, right? So in conclusion, we, we, we just did a content analysis and we suggested a broad uh, range of tools that can help increase the online visibility of uh, research output. Uh, going forward, we think that some of those problems to do with metadata, for instance, we can use uh, machine learning techniques to automatically classify those objects, right? So we don't need people to manually retag the 4,000, 5,000 documents. We can automatically do that. It's a simple thing, right? Um, there are people, I know Angela was wanting to work on this issue of challenges and perception, but her focus is slowly changing. Um, but there are people in the department that have actually projects that have been done in the department centered around identifying challenges and perceptions associated with using institutional repositories. And also going forward, we think that um, because some people might find that submission workflow process complex, we're thinking of experimenting with building you know, simpler tools that people can use to try and make that whole submission process a lot easier. Right? So browser plugins, for instance. Um, um, and also experimenting with techniques that will allow for um, capturing of descriptive metadata that is required. So how can we ensure that when you're submitting that thesis on CD, how can we make sure that you provide us also with important metadata that the two people at the library can at least use to try and make their work a lot easier? I don't know. And then more importantly, we are collaborating with key stakeholders to try and make sure that, um, that we solve this problem, especially, especially this ugly picture here. We want this to change. This is sad, right? This, and I'll leave us with this picture. This is sad because we must sit and reflect about it. We are part of the problem, all of us, right? We want to see Zika's University here as well at some stage, right? And hopefully, if we don't have an IR, um, you and our other colleague, hopefully maybe we can work on a project that is aligned towards that and you know, try and come up with, with a solution to some of these problems, right? In terms of uh, key stakeholders, by the way, some of the things we've done is we've conducted workshops like last year. We are happy to say we had people from Chalimban and Mungushi, right, that attended a workshop and we are in touch with them. We know the people at Mungushi are working towards setting up an institution repository, right? Um, last time we spoke to them, they had actually installed it, right? Um, so it would be good if they are part of that uh, aggregate service we're coming up with so that we see the ETDs that they're generating, right? Um, some time back we, we presented what we are working towards. Uh, I know Abel is very obsessed with open access, so we, we, we interacted briefly with the uh, Educational Authority to see how best we can collaborate with them because, interesting enough, part of what they do is try to assess the quality of, of these institutions of higher learning. And, and when you're assessing quality, you can't run away from the fact that you want to see things to do with postgraduate output, right? So um, this is what you should expect uh, when we have people give talks. Um, and what we're especially keen to have you do is what some of you are doing, like asking questions to say, what about ABCD, right? Uh, that is what we're uh, describing as participation, anyway.
So not just attending and keeping quiet, but participating and asking questions. All right, that was uh, my shameless plug and my trial. Um, so if there are no questions, I think we kept you longer than, oh, we are, we are ahead by one minute here. I don't know if you have any thoughts about this in closing and all that. Um, by the way, uh, as we are doing this, there are certain people that are going to have their fourth year students do presentations. As you're doing your coursework, you want to, to maybe, you want to pay particular attention to some of the things that you think you can pick and choose from this course, for instance, that might help you carve out a research project, right? Attend presentations by fourth years, maybe you get ideas from that. I sent that email, there are exams on Thursday and Friday. Attend those things because your time is coming, whether you like it or not, unless if you pull out, right? But your time is coming, <laughs> and you want to avoid the mistakes that you're going to see at those presentations. There are always mistakes, right? Simple mistakes like you're given 10 minutes and by the time they say 10 minutes is up, you're just halfway through. That's a common mistake. I've attended, and it's not just school of education. I was attending all exams in the school of, uh, I mean, the Department of Computer Science not so long ago. None of the five candidates mean, managed to finish on time. I think one, only one, right? I attended uh, talks by uh, mass communication talks uh, not so long ago. None of the presenters finished on time. Yes, we know 10 minutes is not enough for you to talk about what you did in one or two years, right? But you have ample time to prepare to rehearse, right? Do a demo with your spouse at home with your friends, right? No, seriously, so that you, you know what to expect you. And they'll be able to time you and say, no, you did it in 10 minutes. But please find time for that thing, the Thursday and Friday. You don't have to attend all the Thursday and Friday sessions. Just look at the list I sent and try and see, is this interesting enough? Or is this talk going to be immediate after our, our Thursday, one of our Thursday lecture, lectures, in which case you can easily just walk to the presentations after the lecture and you attend, right? So, all right, I'll see you on, um, on Wednesday next week. And uh, the paper, the reading paper is already there, but I will share specifics of uh, what is expected in the summary, a write-up to say this is how the summary is going to be Weighted. Usually the weighting is, includes things like um, your writing style, things that are going to be used to mark the dissertation once you write it. All right. This presentation, yeah. But the paper, they ask me, we may think is going to get marks. But this, this presentation was just a trap, which is why I was saying. The paper, the first paper that you're going to give us will be a trial. No, that would be for marks. <laughs> but it's but we already know what to do. I, I thought we already explained to say it's just contribute. You see, you you submit your summary. Your summary is going to get marks, and then when we sit, in fact, we sit in a round table, not like like this style is bad. We'll sit in a round table where we're facing each other, right? Yes. Uh, and then. <laughs> It's not a, which is why the, the write-up on Friday will have specifics on how the summary is going to be graded. At some stage, we're going to have to start, and we have to start now, unfortunately. Usually, the first one is good because it's a learning process. It's, it's similar to the first test, right? <laughs> Usually, you, you don't know how questions are said by Dr. Akandira, but you write that test one. Then you know, okay, this is his style. And of course, you can look at past, past uh, questions, obviously. But all right, so thanks a lot. Uh, I'll see you next, um, next week. Thanks. Uh, and by the way, next week we transition into computer networking. Immediately after, I'm sure, I'm sure maybe the following week we will have uh, Mr. Konga grace us. Uh, it's always nice. He was the keynote speaker at ICICT. He was talking about Xamarin, so we can have him talk about that. I know one of the things I asked him was uh, why can't